Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, it's, the, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to, to open this uh, debate on democratic values in a changing world order, a broad enough title to cover several interesting questions. Um, I'd um, like to introduce our panelists before we watch a little movie, a five-minute clip. I myself, I'm Roland Freudenstein, I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research of the Wilfried Machten Center for European Studies based in Brussels. I'm listed up as a representative of Germany, so that's technically true as far as my passport is concerned, but I'm based in Brussels, which is Belgium, and uh, we are the think tank of the European People's Party, which is not as North Korean as it sounds. It is very simply <laughs> the family, the political family of the center-right parties in the European Union. Now, um, I would like to start here on my immediate right with Barbara Haig, who is the deputy to the president for policy and strategy of the National Endowment for Democracy, which in itself is the, may I say, umbrella organization of several democracy support institutions of the United States of America. Um, created in the 1980s and uh, active basically around the globe in promoting uh, democracy and the very democratic values that we are talking about here. Um, next to her, on her right, uh, is Jacob Mchamgama uh, from uh, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. I he works with uh, Justitia. Um, which is uh, an organization that particularly focuses on the rule of law um, and, and legal aspects of, of global democracy. Um, he, he is a lawyer himself, um, and uh, uh, he will particularly focus on, on uh, these questions of the rule of law in, in our debate today. Now, on my left, at least geographically speaking, is Ralf Fuchs, who is the president of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is one of these powerful German institutions that, well, besides a think tank function, also have a very strong component of global democracy support. Um, by the way, he's married to uh, another famous person in Germany, Marie-Louise Beck, who is a member of parliament, and uh, uh, one of the more outspoken ones, I may say. Uh, so, um, uh, 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 and about Ralf Fuchs, I may say just one thing. Um, coming from the political competition, so to speak, I must say uh, uh, he has put the Heinrich Böll Foundation into a pole position uh, in political advocacy. So, as I said, that comes from the competition here. So, complex. Um, and last, but by no means least, Juan Pablo Cardenal from Spain, a journalist who has been particularly focusing on China, on China's footprint, as he likes to call it, in over 40 countries, looking at, you know, investment, political relations, uh, cultural diplomacy, and things like that. And uh, you will also see in the clip that I selected to introduce the topic that uh, China should actually play a particular role in our debates on global democratic values. Now, uh, having said that, without further ado, and uh, uh, I will show you, we will show you a clip which is a TEDx speech. Uh, it's, a, it's a very intense uh, speech giving format. Um, uh, this one here was, I think, given in Silicon Valley. And uh, it is by Eric X. Lee, who is a successful Chinese entrepreneur. But he, as he will just uh, uh, tell you in a second, he started out believing in communism and ended up doubting in the global significance of uh, multi-party democracy. But he will tell us himself. I would like to ask our technicians to play the clip now until I tell you enough. That will be about four and a half minutes. Go ahead. Good morning. When I was growing up, my name is Eric Lee, I was told a story and I was born here that explained all I ever needed to know about humanity. It went like this. All human societies develop in linear progression, beginning with primitive society, then slave society, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and finally, guess where we end up? Communism! 
sooner or later, all of humanity, regardless of culture, language, nationality, will arrive at this final stage of political and social development. The entire world's peoples be unified in this paradise on Earth and live happily ever after. But before we get there, we're engaged in a struggle between good and evil, the good of socialism against the evil of capitalism, and the good shall triumph. That, of course, was the meta narrative distilled from the theories of Karl Marx, and the Chinese bought it. We were taught that grand story day in and day out. It became part of us, and we believed in it. The story was a bestseller. About one third of the entire world's population lived under that meta narrative. Then the world changed overnight. As for me, disillusioned by the failed religion of my youth, I went to America and became a Berkeley hippie. <laughs> Now, as I was coming of age, something else happened. As if one big story wasn't enough, I was told another one. This one was just as grand. It also claims that all human societies develop in linear progression towards a singular end. This one went as follows: All societies, regardless of culture, be it Christian, Muslim, Confucian, must progress from traditional societies in which groups are the basic units to modern societies in which atomized individuals are the sovereign units. And all these individuals are, by definition, rational, and they all want one thing: the vote. Because they are rational, once given the vote, they produce good government. And live happily ever after, <laughs> paradise on earth again. Sooner or later, electoral democracy will be the only political system for all countries and all peoples, with a free market to make them all rich. But before we get there, we're engaged in a struggle between good and evil. <laughs> the good belongs to those who are democracies and are charged with the mission of spreading it around the globe, sometimes by force. Against the evil of those who do not hold elections, a new world order ending tyranny in our world. A single standard for all who would hold power. Now, <laughs> this story also became a bestseller. According to the Freedom House, the number of democracies went from 45 in 1970 to 115 in 2010. In the last 20 years, Western elites tirelessly trotted around the globe selling this prospectus. Multiple parties fight for political power, and everyone voting on them as the only path to salvation to the long-suffering developing world. Those who buy the prospectus are destined for success. Those who do not are doomed to fail. But this time. The Chinese didn't buy it. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> Now, the, the rest is history. In just 30 years, China went from one of the poorest agricultural countries in the world to its second-largest economy. 650 million people were lifted out of poverty. 80 percent of the entire world's poverty alleviation during that period happened in China. In other words, all the new and old democracies put together. Amounted to a mere fraction of what a single one-party state did, without voting. See, I grew up on this stuff: food stamps. Meat was rationed to a few hundred grams per person per month at one point. Needless to say, I ate all my grandmother's portions. So I asked myself, "What's wrong with this picture?" Here I am in my hometown, my business growing leaps and bounds. Entrepreneurs are starting companies every day. Middle class is expanding in, in speed and scale unprecedented in human history. Yet, according to the grand story, none of this should be happening. So I went and did the only thing I could. I studied it. Yes, China is a one-party state run by the Chinese Communist Party, the party, and they don't hold elections. Three assumptions are made by the dominant political theories of our time. Such a system is operationally rigid. Politically closed and morally illegitimate. Well, gentlemen,、uh, so you see where this is going.、Um, actually, I would advise you to to watch the rest of the clip at home. You just Google Eric X Lee,、uh, 
uh, or A Tale of Two Political Systems is actually the title of the speech. And uh, it's a fascinating 17-minute uh, roller coaster ride through a pretty elegant critique of Western universalism. Also, the standing ovations that he collects from the hipster geek crowd of Silicon Valley at the very end are interesting as well. Mm. Anyway, Barbara Haig, we've seen some U.S. presidents uh, uh, here in this clip. Um, it, what is it with Western universalism? Are we finished? Uh, uh, is, there, is there any validity to the argument that there are still binding democratic values that uh, uh, are valid around the globe? Uh, I don't think I'm going to surprise you very much, uh, given where I'm from and the institution where I've worked for 30 years, uh, that yes, I think there are universal values. And I enjoy Mr. Lee, but um, I think he described those values and the democratic system in a, a sort of a caricature of what it is. Um, and he also, I think, described the system that he's supporting in caricature form. Um, and I, I also think his selection of clips and so on, um, he reminded me in some ways of a, a somewhat more sophisticated, more data-driven um, version of Donald Trump, sort of playing to... Uh, emotions and channeling the venting that people have against things that don't work, um, but not necessarily a sound basis for analyzing what are the best choices. Um, but yes, I think universal values came about, in a sense, out of history. Uh, a history where, particularly after the, second, the, the First and Second World War, um, drove mankind to say, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? What is the this? The this is, is everything from genocide to tyranny of states against their own people uh, to mass uh, migrations of desperate human beings um, and massive destruction. And so we strove to create a set of institutions and principles that would help to guide us uh, in the tensions that emerge within states and among states, within societies and peoples, and to find mechanisms and rules for trying to manage these, these natural tensions and to try to manage the worst instincts of, of human beings that can come into play. Some people rise to power with the worst instincts. So uh, these things didn't, didn't come out of simply Western, I don't know, Western self-interest. They came out of global self-interest, which is why they are embedded in international law. And I'm referring most particularly to what I refer to, what most people refer to it as the first principles. So those, uh, those principles that deal with human, political, and civic rights. Um, and just, again, to say there's no way that this is just a Western phenomenon. Um, one can argue where the ideas came from, but the resonance that they have had really across the globe are, to me, indisputable. Um, and cultural differences exist everywhere. They exist in the West, they exist within Western countries, there are cultural differences, there are different traditions. Um, I don't buy the argument that that should mitigate against, uh, against these universal principles. Um, just thinking a little bit about if you ask people in Sri Lanka, uh, are, are human rights values Western values, or are they values that we in Sri Lanka need in order to survive? Um, if you look around Africa, Africa adopted a democracy charter which is more progressive than the OAS democracy charter. And while it is a long way from you know, perfect implementation, to say the least, many of the countries of Africa ratified it and they have adhered to, uh, at least in the sense of 
um, non-recognition of coups and so on. And they are working for having election observation. They have a parliamentary institution that monitors elections and so on. Um, this did not come from the United States or the West. This came from Africans. Um, there are Africans who every day are suffering and struggling and dying for these values and principles to bring them to their countries. Um, it's not because they are a fifth column uh, being funded by the West. Um, I don't know if I should go on or give I, others... I think, no, no, this is, this is, this is great for, for a first uh, uh, statement in, in, this, in this panel. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the universality of, uh, of the core values is, I think, the, 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 the most important thing uh, to emphasize in this, in this respect. And um, I'd now like, now like to turn to Ralf Fuchs and ask him, well, first of all, I mean, we've had references to American democracy here and American mm -hmm. activities in this clip. Um, is there a difference between European and American concepts of global uh, democratic values? Couldn't some Europeans think that maybe they fare better and they gain credibility in countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America if they don't associate too closely with uh, a nation whose president said mission accomplished, as we saw in the clip? And what about the, the self-doubts that we're be beginning to develop about democracy here? Yours. Yeah, maybe I'll start with the last uh, point, the self-doubt. And I think this is part of the story we have been told by these Chinese-American entrepreneurs uh, living in, in, in California, making business in Silicon Valley, but challenging the idea of universal democratic values and, 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 and principles. And I think there are different root causes for, for, for that. The first, I agree very much with Barbara that this was a kind of caricature in, in that, that called the idea of democracy is no re recipe to paradise. It is much more a prevention to hell. Yes. <laughs> and this is the, the, I would say, the consequence, the overarching consequence of the experiences of the last century, the totalitarian century. Um, and to quote Churchill, you know, it's, it's the best of all bad uh, governance systems, a, a democracy, but we, we, we should not make a religion out of it. So, but more of that, um, I think this kind of talk is reflecting a crisis of democracy in our own world in the United States as well as in, in Europe, and we are not so much different in that. If you're looking to Europe, the rise of right-wing and left-wing populist movements and parties all over Europe, uh, the shrinking uh, participation in democratic elections, the crisis of the credibility and authority of the political class. If you're looking to the, the US, Donald Trump is leading, I would say an anti-politician an anti is leading the field of the Republican candidates. And Marie Le Pen in France is leading in the polls for the presidential elections. <coughs> Or look to Hungary, now where there's a policy in place which is conflicting, I would say, with uh, basic uh, democratic values and, and, and principles within the European Union. So I would say to regain global credibility, we have to do our homework. We must re-energize democracy at home. This is very fundamental. Uh, and it's not only about the political sphere. I would say part of this 
credibility crisis of the democratic systems in the Western world is growing social inequality, a loss of economic dynamics, um, and a loss of trust in the future. You know, when I'm looking to, to Germany, uh, I'm really, f to a certain extent, frightened or, or embarrassed by um, polls that show that for the first time in Germany after Second World War, the current generation does no longer expect that our children will have a better life. They see a worsening or a darkening future. I think these are really very serious problems we have to um, deal with at home. And this is the, 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 the precondition that we, I would say, regain a kind of self-confidence against these new emerging authoritarian powers like China. And I know this kind of talk we, we heard. If you're, if you're uh, um, debating with, with people from China, modern academics from, from China, you, you very often hear, okay, you talk about uh, uh, liberal freedoms, but what's about education? What's about the rise of the middle class? You already quoted that. China is socially much more successful and it has done much more for the dignity of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people than other pro forma democratic countries all over the world. So they don't refer to, to the liberal values, they refer to the social achievements of their societies and of, of their systems. And I think we only can successfully uh, confront these, these, these attitudes if we ourselves, I would say, regain a sense of social democracy at home. Not in a, in a, in a narrow partisan sense, but you know, the, this combining of social progress and, and democratic governance. Um, this would be a, a preliminary answer to... Uh, uh, to, to, to start the discussion and um, to come back to your initial question. Um, if, if it is really about democratic values and principles, there is still, I would say, there is something like the West, defined by um, history of democratic revolution in Europe and in, in the United States. Um, but we have to be very careful uh, not to, 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 to lose this um, heritage, yeah, but to, and, 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 and we, we cannot just um, uh, take it for granted. Democracy have, has to be re energized and has to be renewed. Uh, by every generation. Wasn't it Ronald Reagan who said we're always one generation away from tyranny? It's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's yeah, maybe yeah. a more bombastic way of, but it's the, 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 it's the same idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I think, I mean, if, if someone is tweeting here in this room, the, the, I think your initial statement of uh, uh, democracy is no guaranteed uh, road to paradise, but it's an avoidance of hell. Uh, that would be the tweet I would send. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Uh, sticking for a moment to China, um, Juan Pablo, uh, what do you make of, of, of this argument that, uh, you know, towards the end of uh, the, the speech, uh, Eric Lee actually says that, look, I'm not telling you how to run your countries. Just don't lecture us uh, uh, how we should run China because we've been extremely successful for the last couple of decades and, uh, by, by some kind of authoritarianism, by, by precisely the lack of multi-party democracy is, in his view, the, the recipe to Chinese success and lifting these um, uh, half a billion people out of poverty. So uh, what, what do we answer to this? And is it true that the Chinese actually uh, are not preaching to others? 
Well, um, Roland, if you remember, I want to share this with the audience uh, that you suggested us to see the whole, uh, the whole piece, 20, 25 minutes. And I really wanted to follow your, your suggestion, but after eight minutes, I had to, to give up, to be honest. I was completely exhausted by what I, what I, by what I was hearing. And honestly, I've been based in, as a foreign correspondent in China for, for over a decade, and all that uh, rhetoric was too very familiar to me, you know, uh, including the fact that he gives the credit of uh, China's, of, of three decades of progress, economic progress in China, to the model that they have or, or to, the, to the CPC, to the Communist Party of China, rather than to the people that made the effort, you know, to, which is the, the Chinese population. Um, I'd like to, uh, so, so that's why I didn't, I didn't uh, decide to, to see the whole thing because probably I, I, I knew exactly what he was going to tell. But uh, this kind of debate that we, that we are having today and, and that we heard from Eric Lee, uh, when I was in China, it was a very common, we, we had this kind of debate among my colleagues. It was very, it's a very, very common debate. Uh, you know, probably it's not fair, but uh, journalists are put into two groups. You know, you are either a China basher or you mm. are a panda hugger, you know. So I was, uh, I often had a, um, a question for the panda huggers, which is, I, I used to ask them, listen, if you uh, would happen to be born again, would you prefer to be a poor Chinese peasant or you would prefer to be a poor a peasant from Thailand, for instance? And the, the, the answer would always be a peasant from Thailand. And what that, ex what that tells me is mm -hmm. that uh, when we judge uh, or we describe or we explain the, the so-called uh, um, Chin Chinese miracle, you know, we are always using uh, factors that we can measure economically. You know? And what I would argue, and many other people argue, is that there are many other factors that you cannot measure economically which make a huge contribution to human well-being, you know? And that's, uh, that explains exactly what, what we're talking about here, you know? Um, the other thing is, um, mm. one, if, if Eric Lee would be here, I would, I would ask him, why does he, uh, and, and, and not only him, also the, the Communist Party of, of uh, China, what, of China why, why do they have the right to ask, uh, to tell, to the Chinese people that they cannot enjoy freedom, you know? Who are they to, 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 mm. to, to, to tell them that, you know? Um, if you allow me, moving to something different, um, I'd like to make a few remarks, if you allow me, Roland, which is first on China's domestic situation. Uh, we, we, we've been hearing through the last couple of decades that China would become more democratic once it becomes more uh, developed, you know? I, I think it's, it, I, I, Today, we, we, we should already acknowledge that this is not going to happen. At least, I'm a, I have a very pessimistic view on that, you know. And let me give you just two examples, you know. The ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, one of the two most important frameworks on the human rights uh, international architecture. China um, signed it in 98, when they were negotiating the, their accession to WTO. But 18 years later, they have not ratified. Why is that? Because they would not be in a position to implement what this uh, uh, legal framework tells, tells, uh, says. Um, because by, by ratifying it and by implementing it, you become a democracy. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, this is a road to democracy and the fact that they don't want to ratify it tells us very clearly that the Chinese government is not willing to go uh, through that uh, path. Second is what happened last year in Hong Kong, which is, yeah, of, of course, there, there was the, the debate was about um, the, the having a, a completely fully democratic uh, uh, electoral system. But the, the, the bottom line of it is that the people in Hong Kong want to, to elect their own people, people that are accountable to the people of Hong Kong and not to the Chinese government, you know. Why? Because of the interferences of Beijing since the handover in, in 97. And, but the bottom line of, 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 that, of that whole issue um, was the fact that we are at the beginning of the end of the one party, two, two systems formula. You know? China had the opportunity in 97 to follow a model which had already proved itself as being 
successful in the sense that Hong Kong is one of the most uh, uh, prosper and, and free uh, territories in Asia. And they had that mirror to look into, and they decided uh, not to follow it. They, they've decided to, to integrate Hong Kong into mainland China instead of using uh, and to follow uh, the authoritarian uh, model that mm. they have. Uh, I think Xi Jinping was, uh, has been once again uh, labeled as a reformist. I don't think he's a reformist in the sense that we would all like. You know, he's a reformist in the sense that he wants to make the Chinese model more efficient. But he doesn't want mm. to make the Chinese model uh, like a, we uh, a Western-style uh, democracy or, or nothing like this. You know, I think that this is something it should be clear to all of us uh, um, at this point. Let me finish with something uh, that has to do with China impacting the rest of the world. You know, for for uh, the last six years, I've been researching in 40 countries, and uh, I have a, um, a good sense of what's happening on the ground. And in terms, I could be speaking here for hours, but uh, let me stick to something very specific. Um, how China, how uh, governments, including Western governments, see, see the, their relationship with China. Basically, is they are perceived as unavoidable economically. This makes uh, the Western governments to prioritize um, business. Therefore, they, they have to create the appropriate uh, business atmosphere in order to allow those business opportunities. So how do they do that? Basically, I mean, we could talk a lot about it, but I, would, I, would, I have a list of things that they are doing. First of all, they are not looking into the nature of the investor, which is most of the times the, the, the Chinese state. Secondly, they are not looking into unfair competition of China's uh, state capitalism. They are not looking into the lack of reciprocity. And they are also, we are, seeing, we are seeing already a few examples of Western governments lowering standards. And the most uh, sad, uh, sad um, thing that they are doing, at least for me, is that they are giving up on human rights. So real politic is leading over principle and values. Um, and let me tell you, one surprise that I, I mean, of course, this is only an opinion, but one thing that surprised me very much during my research is that I see governments, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the human rights is co issue is completely off the agenda. And honestly, I haven't seen Western societies being very concerned about it. So this makes me think or ask myself if, I mean, how, re how important were human rights for all of us? You know, I think uh, when it came, when because of the crisis, um, not only governments, but people are sticking to to other issues, and I don't think that uh, human rights is, is really that important uh, for, for many of us, unfortunately. Um, well, uh, I, would, I, would, I wanted to have a word on, on, on the fact that the human rights that, um, issue between China and, and Western states has been is non, non-existent, or in, some, in cases of some countries has have been pushed to human rights uh, bilateral dialogues, in which they are confidential and classified meetings, in which supposedly uh, you can talk about, uh, you, you talk about human rights in China in order to make some progress, which has never happened. Mm -hmm. And all of this was possible because uh, China gave the promise that with this kind of uh, environment, then th there could be some progress in human rights. I think it's been a complete failure, and countries like Canada decided to to, to, to quit this, um, this kind of um, um, bilateral dialogues. Just to finish up around, um, I just want to point out three uh, risks or three conclusions that I've seen throughout my, my research. First of all, China arrives um, to the rest of the world, including the West, with its own rules, practices, and values. That, for me, that is very clear. Secondly, the world is adapting to China and, and, and not the other way around, which is very concerning. And the conclusion is that um, in the past, the West's, uh, the West's uh, aspiration was to change China. I think these days, what we're seeing is that we are happy enough if we can live with her. Indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to reinforce your point, uh, let me share this one mm -hmm. thing with you. Uh, I used to work for the government of Hamburg, which is a time-honored German state. And uh, 
uh, Hamburg prides itself on a, what they call the rule of law dialogue with uh, the city of Shanghai because Hamburg has region to region relations with several places in the world. Shanghai is one of them. And I asked these um, uh, fellow uh, administrators in, back in Hamburg, so what do you talk about in these uh, rule of law dialogues? And in a, slight, uh, in a slight mood of cynicism, one of them replied to me, well, Roland, it's very simple. We tell the Chinese that we have a problem with their human rights situation, and they tell us that they have no problem with the fact that we have a problem with their human rights situation. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's, ki it's kind of... I think my personal impression also from talking to Chinese diplomats in Brussels, who lobby us heavily, um, maybe that should worry us, but... Uh, uh, these, uh, my personal experience is that, that they have become much cooler or more relaxed about, mm. about our uh, talk uh, on human rights. They're not as allergic as they used to be, which should really make us worry, indeed. So, um, y y coming back to, to Ralf Fuchs, um, yeah, re-energized democracy would be part of the answer, probably. Um, but let's first hear the, the fourth panelist, uh, Jacob Jacob, you, you focus very much on, 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 on legal systems and the legal aspects. And so, what is the future of uh, liberal democracy in the sense of elections plus checks and balances, independent justice, uh, institutional arrangements which guarantee that no one really can fully take over the system? So, uh, are, you know, are we all doomed? Is that, is a, will that be a thing of the 20th century? I hope not. Um, the rule of law, of course, is a, is a huge concept and there can be many various competing uh, definitions of it. But I, I want to focus on, on one aspect that, uh, of, of the rule of law that would be included in, in a liberal democracy, namely that, uh, which you also mentioned heavily, that of, of, of human rights um, and fundamental freedoms in, in particular. Um, because that was, of course, one of the things that Eric did not mention. He did not mention rule of law, he did not mention uh, fundamental uh, uh, freedoms. Um, but we do live in worrying times, I don't think there's any denying that. We live, uh, if, if, if we are to believe Freedom House, this is the ninth or the tenth year that global freedoms are in decline globally. Uh, we see that civil society is under attack, we see that authoritarians are on the offensive. And we see, perhaps uh, most worryingly, that democracies are increasingly unable and even unwilling to, to stand up for principles. So the times that we live in now are, are very different from previous decades where we had waves of democratization, where we had a commitment to individual rights as the cornerstone of legitimate uh, government, governance. Uh, there are lots of, of, of reasons for this. One of them, of course, is the shifting balance of power in international relations from what we can call northwest to, to the southeast. Um, there are, of course, also very different uh, differences in political cultures between the countries that were democratized in Central and Eastern Europe and the countries that have failed to democratize in, in the MENA region after the Arab Spring, uh, for instance. But one of the international community's central instruments supposed to embody, institutionalize, and safeguard universal values that we talk about today uh, is that of international uh, human rights. And um, perhaps the, the adoption of the Helsinki Final Act uh, committing, at least on paper, communist states uh, to human rights was, was perhaps the, most, the finest hour of the modern uh, international human rights movement um, because human rights conventions that were just about to enter into force uh, empowered dissidents in closed societies. And since we're here in Prague at the Forum 2000, I think it's appropriate to quote from the illustrious Charter 77, where the Charters wrote that the human rights and freedoms underwritten by these covenants constitute features of civilized life for which many progressive movements have striven throughout history and whose codification could greatly assist humane developments in our society. Now, of course, uh, the brave dissidents of Charter 77 were lamenting that these uh, even, though the Czech, uh, even though Czechoslovakia had, had, had signed these uh, covenants, they only existed in paper. But at least it was very clear what these rights meant. No one was in doubt that the communist states violated freedom of conscience, treated its political prisoners inhumanely, disregarded the privacy of their citizens, uh, and that clarity made it possible to use the Helsinki framework, human rights conventions, to criticize and gain concessions from otherwise authoritarian states. But, and this is where uh, my argument comes in, which may or may not be a little bit provocative to some, 
the concept of human rights, as the co concept of human rights has developed since, I think it's questionable if human rights will be able to play the same role for tomorrow's Chartists. Um, the world is becoming less free, but this striking crisis of, of human rights takes place at a time when there, on paper, have never been more human rights, where references to human rights are ubiquitous and have become one of the central currencies in international law and politics. Even China, even Saudi Arabia, even Russia will, will talk about, uh, will, will talk about uh, human rights. But I would say that this currency of human rights has been seriously devalued through a process of, among other things, rights inflation, which will inhibit the ability of human rights to serve as a basic moral legal framework for international relation and therefore ultimately perhaps deprive us of a powerful tool in the struggle to reverse uh, freedom's decline. Um, and it's important, I'll, I'll get back to that, uh, that countries such as China, um, such as Russia, such as Saudi Arabia, non-free states um, very actively contribute to, to this development by changing what we understand by, uh, by, by, by human rights. If we look at the, 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 uh, all the legally binding human rights conventions under the UN and the Council of Europe, we have a total of 64 legally binding human rights instruments, 1,377 provisions therein. Um, and we started out with 30 rights in the Universal Declaration in 1948. And so, what's the problem? Why is the growth in human rights standards a problem rather than an enrichment? Well, first of all, if we talk about rule of law, you have to have clarity. Human rights, basic rights, have to be understandable for people everywhere. You cannot have uh, human rights that are uh, about as accessible as uh, the US tax code. But more fundamentally, if human, international human rights law is transformed so fundamentally that it no longer reflects its moral foundations, illiberal states will be able to hide themselves behind an inflated human rights concept and even use it to mount political attacks against liberal states and human rights defenders. And if we take a look at the little microcosmos of the United Nations Human Rights Council, whose members include Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, I think it's quite il illustrative uh, because there's a very noticeable difference in the emphasis that states on the Human Rights Council attach to different types uh, of rights. So liberal democracies, who are most often in the minority, um, tend to focus more on fundamental freedoms. But then you have less free states who tend to uh, want to develop new concepts of human rights, right to development, uh, the right to peace, international solidarity, all of these rights have the state as the beneficiary of some foggy concept of human rights that doesn't mean anything. But what they do not have any focus on is accountability for those in power and empowerment of uh, those individuals who those uh, states uh, tend to uh, repress. And so by presenting themselves as champions of these often meaningless human rights, they seek both to remove the moral high ground from liberal states and to achieve uh, political legitimacy. Cuba is actually now the state on the Human Rights Council that has sponsored most of the thematic mandates uh, of, of the Human Rights Council. I think that tells us a story um, about uh, the direction. We also see uh, during the, the, the Council's universal periodic review process, a few years ago, North Korea was praised by Cuba, Iran, Russia, and Syria for working to, quote, consolidate a socialist and just society which guarantees equality and justice. Um, only six months before Bashar al-Assad began his crackdown on Syrian protesters, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health went there to, to, to Syria. He praised the Syrian regime in his, in his report, and he lamented the, the prevalence of tobacco smoking in Syria as a human rights problem. Um, <laughs> that um, might not be the biggest uh, concern. <laughs> Um, also, we have seen the cons council uh, furthering agendas such as defamation of religion, traditional values, all aimed at restricting freedoms and legitimizing authoritarianism. But even in Europe, I would say that the concept of human rights is undergoing changes to its more liberal DNA. It's now common for a European human rights institution, for instance, to argue that we should have more restrictions on, on free speech. But we also see it uh, that this inflated version of human rights is being used by human rights organizations to actually praise countries like China, saying, well, yes, they have 
put uh, several hundred million out of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, lifted them out of poverty, and we have to praise them. Uh, we have to praise them of that. So, if the concept of, of human rights becomes so broad that you know free speech uh, is one thing, but you know a foggy concept of the right to development or international solidarity, whatever that means, uh, is just as important then we can sit in international conferences in Geneva, Brussels, and New York and just shoot the breeze and uh, no one has the moral high ground and there's very little capacity for keeping anyone uh, accountable. So um, I think unless this development is stopped, the drafters of a Charter 2030 may very well invoke human rights to argue for a world with less rather than more freedom. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much, Jacob. Well. I guess this goes for all the panelists. Um, this was just the first round. We're going to have a few back and forth among the panel, and then we're going to open up to you, the audience. Um, it, just, just coming back to this one point, Jacob, that you made. Um, so the gist of what you said is get back to basics then. Exactly. Uh, focus, focus on more on the core of uh, human rights, individual human rights. But just one follow-up question from me here. How? How do we do that? Which are the instruments with which, um, let's say, the, the uh, liberal democracies, as opposed to illiberal states and authoritarian states, could force such an agenda? How can we push that? Well, it's obviously difficult because, you know, uh, real politics <laughs> suggests that, I mean, everyone wants to, to trade with China and my country, Denmark, in 1997, they tried to have a critical resolution against China in the Commission on Human Rights. And this was in 97, so before China had reached its current level, and Denmark was killed, I mean, absolutely killed, and no one has ever tried to, 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 to do that again. But I think that too often, I, I, you know, the, the, you know Western, Western states, liberal democracies, are too timid uh, about, about standing up uh, for, for, for principles. And... At the Human Rights Council, the EU should, you know, be able to, to. I think they're they're basically punching below our our our, our weight, uh, you know, as, as a group of, of relatively powerful states, even though the, that power may be uh, in, in in decline. Um, uh, and 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 uh, there's this uh, being uncomfortable about uh, about talking uh, about hard truths and. Uh, uh, but, but one thing, you know, when you, you might be confronted with things like, well, you know, colonialism and all these things. And I think that's, you know, that's perfectly in place for other people to, to say that. But then we should say, well, the, you know, what happened under colonialism was, you know, a direct affront to those principles. And that, you know, shows, you know, that Western states are not uh, perfect, they have a capacity of evil just uh, uh, as, as others as committing great injustices and these are the principles that we need to have in place in order to ensure that these things do not happen uh, whether uh, those uh, committing them are Westerners or, uh, or Chinese or, or whatever. Um, but, but I think we need to be more, more bold and then maybe also sometimes take defeats. Uh, th there's an unwillingness to push uh, for, for resolutions, for instance, that you, where you say, well, we're never going to get the votes. Well, then, you know, take it up there, push it out, try, try and, and put the, the right resolutions out, say the right things, and then, you know, for all the world to see that there's this, uh, you know, unholy alliance uh, of, of authoritarian states that will go against it. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, those are some of the uh, ways to do. And then, uh, sorry for talk, speaking so long, but going back to what you said, you know, at home, never, never, you know, bend to, for instance, China. In Denmark, we have had, you know, pro-Tibetan uh, protesters demonstrating at Chinese state visits. What happens? The Danish police come and they remove them. And we've seen that also in other uh, European countries, liberal democracy. I think that's shocking, absolutely shocking. One thing is, you know, at the UN, you know, there's a quid pro quo, but at home, you know, abridging your constitutional values because the Chinese don't like to see Tibetan flags. I think then you have basically signaled that your supposedly most fundamental values are for sale, and that does not inspire confidence or respect from the counterpart. Quite the other. Okay, thanks very much, Roland. Can I, can I just add uh, something related Ralph to that? Ralph was before, but, oh, but yeah. please, well, okay. It's then just a, Juan it's, Pablo and please, then please, please, because it's related to what yeah. he said very quick. Um, I think in regards of China, 
um, China has been extremely successful in, um, in making Western governments or other, other governments think that if, there's, if, there's, uh, if, you, if they don't have the appropriate uh, um, institutional and diplomatic atmosphere, that, that business is not possible. You know? mm. And we, we have a very good example in Norway that tells us that it's not exact. Of course, a, a proper uh, diplomatic atmosphere means dropping the, the human rights uh, of the agenda. But <laughs> there's been some cases, not many, a few of them, but one that like, I can remember of is Norway. You know, as, as we probably all know, when uh, Liu Xiaobo was granted with the um, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, mm. there was some retaliation uh, uh, by China to Norway because they believed it, it was a decision, an indirect decision by the, by the Norwegian government to, to, to give this uh, prize to, to Liu Xiaobo. Well, it was all over the news that, that the Norwegian salmon could not enter uh, the, uh, the Chinese market because of this. And that's true. But that is um, a very, I would, I would argue, a very insignificant percentage of the bilateral, of the trade bilateral relationship between the two countries. At the very heart of this uh, um, conflict between the two countries, China bought a chemical, a Norwegian chemical company paying two billion US dollars. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, China has delivered this message, but mm -hmm. when it's in their, in their interest to continue to do business with, uh, with other countries, they, they will still do it, even there, if there's a, a conflict in, in other areas. You know? And so when you ask the, the question of what can we do, well, I think that uh, the, the, the other government, the, the, the foreign governments, should, should uh, think in this way, in the sense that, well, you, th those are separate areas. You can, you can be very, uh, I mean, make your point very aggressively, if you want, on, on human rights and other issues, and still do business. And this is something that I've seen in, that many governments believe that those things cannot go together. And I, I really don't think that's the case. Okay, thanks. Lord Fuchs. Yeah, I would agree that, of course, we should be more self-confident and outspoken, sticking to our values and, and principles. Um, but at the same time, again, I would say credibility is uh, created at home. And if you're looking to the refugee crisis and the way Europe in the moment is dealing with that. I think this is the most serious test how credible we are in preaching human rights. You know, all these hundred thousands of refugees from the war zones in the in the Middle East are they human beings with basic human rights? Or do we just treat them as kind of hostile invaders? You know, and the world is looking to that or looking at that. And if, you, if you're listening uh, to, to, to the comments, for instance, from, from, from the, the, the Russia state press you know, on the refugee crisis in Europe, you know, they... Um, uh, are enjoying it, yeah? and they they are speculating that the European Union will fall apart. So I don't say there is uh, an easy answer. Uh, I, I I don't say uh, we uh, just should uh, open our borders un un unlimited. Of course, this will not work because uh, um, adaptation and, and integration capacities are not infinite. But the picture we are showing today, that the European Union is not capable to deal with this refugee crisis in a common, solidaric way, this is very dangerous also for, for our external relation. It nourishes the sense of cynicism that 
Human rights are only kind of the Sunday sermon in the church. But if it becomes serious, yeah, it, it doesn't matter any all. So, um, to talk about the elephant in the room, the refugee crisis uh, in, the, in, the, in the current uh, European political theater, I think we have to be very, very careful on the one hand to keep the European Union and the uh, European societies together, but not on the expense of people in need. Not on the expense of people in need. This is the, the, the basic humanitarian and political challenge we are facing today. And if I may add another comment uh, to what has been said on, on China and um, no, I'm not sure, and I would be interested in your reading, uh, your analysis, if these authoritarian regimes, and, and China is the most prominent example, really, uh, on the long run, could continue their economic success story without political reform, without changing their governance system to more pluralism, to more individual freedoms, to more checks and, 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 and balances. I would doubt that. Of course, this is another uh, debate. Um, so I would not um, bow. Uh, I, I, I would not sign this, uh, these narratives that you could decouple democracy and economic success on the long run. I would doubt that. And I think, on the other hand, we have to prove that uh, democratic uh, societies, democratic political systems can be economically successful. And this is another part of the homework we have to do. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, sure. I'd like to turn to Barbara uh, sure. for a kind of uh, commentary on what has been said so far. Uh, well, the more we go around, the more, the more issues I have, so I'll try to keep them concise. Um, first, on the, on the last point that, that Ralph just made, I wholeheartedly agree. I think there's only a certain amount of reform. China was starting from a very low point um, in terms of, of trying to grapple with economic, find a way towards economic growth. Um, I think there will come a limit to what they're they're able to do without without some kind of political reform or liberalization of some sort. Um, secondly, on the the other points you were making about the moment that that it's Europe, it's the United States as well uh, is facing with regard to Syria, and uh, I think I think that you're right. It will be very telling to see how it's resolved. But I also think that democracies sometimes become complacent, but when there's a serious, serious crisis, sometimes that's the catalyst for shaking us up and getting us to get our fundamentals straight again. And why, why Syria could be that moment is because if you look at why do we have this situation in the first place, it's because of the, the lack of political freedoms, transparency, accountability, and so on in, in Syria in the first place, and a lot of other things that, that progressed uh, down the road that uh, sort of ignored uh, the internet, these principles um, and didn't take, didn't take action. So that might be a catalyst, and we always have to look for the silver lining in what looks like a total mess and disaster for humanity. On uh, Chinese investments and their influence in other countries, um, again, I'm wondering if, and we shouldn't miss this moment, if there isn't a moment happening, because a lot of the, uh, the scandals and the protests that are happening, for instance, in Latin America, uh, the scandals are often tied to uh, investment from China, by the way. Um, from some of the very same heads of ministries that are 
being targeted in this uh, corruption, this very politicized but nonetheless aggressive corruption, uh, anti-corruption campaign in China. Um, so it's again the lack of transparency, accountability, paying any attention to the citizens and their interests and their voice in the deals that are being made and cut. They're just made amongst leaders, no mess, no fuss, until it's, until it's a scandal down the road. And so I think that is also set as a reflection of the system in, in China that people ought to take into account a little bit more. And then on Juan Carlos, um, in, in asserting in part what we should be doing, uh, I totally, totally agree with you, again, with everyone here, um, that even if we're gonna lose a vote in a venue like the UN or the Human Rights Council, that it really is important to stick to those principles. And I have to say that people, citizens in a lot of the countries that are being victimized by tyrannical regimes or, or state actors crossing in and, and whipping up ethnic wars and so on across their borders, they, they turn to those, even if they don't win, they turn to those countries um, and if there's a colonial problem, then they'll turn to the U.S. If there's, if there's a Iraq war problem, they turn to the EU. I mean, they find those voices and players that they think are sticking up to those principles as their histories, uh, you know, allow them to do. So I, I think, you know, it, it serves more of a purpose than simply... Uh, a statement. It's it's actually a tool that can be used by human rights advocates in other countries, and we should be giving that tool to them. Thank you, Barbara. I would like to open this up now. Uh, please let me let me know. We have a microphone somewhere. Yes, over there. And would you please very briefly introduce yourself and then ask your question. <laughs> nope, no, not yet. Sometimes it takes a few seconds, but... Yeah, I think it's on now. It's on? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I'm Vincent Meden from the International Campaign for Tibet in Brussels. Um, I'm happy that um, a lot of the space was given to China. I think that's a very important uh, debate to have. Um, and I would like to echo very much uh, what Mr. Uh, Cardinal said. Um, and I very much share uh, your point of view on, uh, I think today that China is a kind of proposing a sort of alternative model of mixing both uh, capitalism and then an authoritarian regime that is in place. And to the question, is this uh, system sustainable in the future, in the long run? That's a very difficult question to answer. But so far, people who said you know, by with this business and the trade and the globalization, at one point China will have to change. China will be imbricated, linked with other countries. So inevitably, you know, at the end, political reform will appear. But so far, nothing is going in that direction. So China has been able to avoid any political reform and keeping the system in place. So <laughs> I think that we, and now there is a challenge also for our society and our Western Democracy. Of course, we have homeworks to do. We have problems here, and we are not. We don't have a perfect model. But at least we enjoy a certain le uh, level of liberty and freedom. That is not uh, the case. Not the case for Chinese or minority people, Tibetan people, and so on. So I think that we have a responsibility here to also help these people also. Um, and. I think it's also a little bit dangerous to say, well, they have lifted, lifted out of poverty hundreds of millions of people. Um, so we should recognize that, of course, but at what price? What is the price of that today? Um, and I think that Chinese are saying, well, first we give, um, you know, social rights, right to food, right to, uh, to, to consumption and so on. And afterwards, we will give the right, political rights, civil rights. <clears throat> and this challenges our universality of human rights that we should fight for. So I think in Europe, uh, we have to uh, prevent, so, so to say, the Chinese model to export itself more and more and to be a convincing model for other undemocratic countries. 
and I would like very much to know uh, furthermore the opinion on how we can do it uh, uh, in particular in our Western societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I think the discussion on the instruments and the methods should, should uh, merit some further, some further remarks from our side. Uh, the gentleman here in the, in the second row, in the middle. Uh, my name is <coughs> Matja Shershi, Community of Democracies. I would like to make two comments, one to China and about the instruments that is being discussed. On China, I just very much shared this very, very short comment of Barbara saying it's a little bit strange that somebody is speaking in Silicon Valley and criticizing uh, this system. And also we can, I think, add that people vote with their feet. I see even today hundreds of thousands of, mil of millions, not me, hundreds of thousands of Chinese leaving China and choosing our part of the world, which I think to me is much more efficient and substantive argument than what I see in such a, a speech which is applauded by maybe 100 people. So I would not pay too much attention to that. Interesting to see. My second comment is about how can we see China in the future? Very difficult to see, but I have a personal concept on this. When people uh, are bothered how to make both and meats, uh, to provide the basics for their families is much, uh, is much less, much, very little room left to fight for liberties and democracies. And as living standard is slowly increasing, it will also open up for the demands of other sort of requests by the people, and requests turn to be a de demand. So I just do not think that this opening of the economy in China will be able to to, to continue to have a one-party system because economy is also about making free choices and it cannot be limited, I think, on the longer run, only to economy. So I'm optimistic, although I never know, I don't know when it will take place. And finally, on the instruments, very important question because dictators come to alliances. They learn from each other and when they go to UN or any other platform, in the Council of Europe, they know exactly how to, 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 to stand up unitedly. So Democrats should do the same thing. And the organization I represent now, the Committee of Democracies, has exactly this ambition. We are applying for an observer status in the UN, and we would like to provide a platform for democracies to, to discuss our policies and strategies in the UN. So we can also become more united, not only, not only dictators, and uh, it's a beginning of a process, but I think if we are doing this alliance work for us in a much better way, I think our chances will grow. Democracy is not a status, not a heaven. It's a continuing fight, so we have to do it better. Excellent. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Not for the moment. So I'd like to ask our, our panelists to maybe tackle some of these points that were raised. Juan Pablo, would you like yeah. to start? Sure. Um, several, several remarks. Um, I think uh, what's going to happen in the future, I think, is the million-dollar question, I and mean, nobody, <laughs> no, nobody knows. Future is difficult to predict. <laughs> um, my logic would tell me that they won't be able to survive. I mean, the CPC, unless there's a, a political openness, you know. But the truth is. I don't see that the political elites have any incentive at all mm -hmm. to change the system because the, or to change the status quo because they are the beneficiaries of this status quo. And history in China shows us that changes many times come through pain and, and blood sometimes. You know? So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't really give, see uh, China willing to give up on their monopoly of, of, of power. The other thing is... Um, one thing that I've noticed, I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have the same, is that China, I mean, China observers, Chinese government, Chinese uh, sources have become quite arrogant on respect of this debate in the sense mm -hmm. that they see, since 2008, our model as a, as, as a um, failed. Failure, yeah, in a way, you know, in the sense, well, look in the mess that your guys are in, 
therefore your model doesn't work. Mm -hmm. While it is true that China has been able to go through the crisis rather strongly. So they, they, they just portrayed that as an example that their model is the one that best suits uh, the, their, their country, you know. I mean, it's a very solid argument on their, on their side, but of course I, I completely disagree with it. Um, in what you said about the Chinese uh, diaspora, so many people willing to, to, to leave the country, uh, that was one of the topics that I've been following in the last uh, few months, you know. And I've been in touch with, uh, with um, some uh, lawyers in Hong Kong and other places which, uh, which um, give this kind of service to rich Chinese that want to, to have their residency, resi residency abroad. And they, they, what it is said is, is that they use this residency abroad as an exit door in yes. case something goes wrong. And of course, in the same, uh, in the same situation, they would uh, try to put part of their fortune uh, abroad safely. You know? um, what some of them were telling me is that their customers were telling them that they were not sleeping well these days because they don't believe in the future of China. Mm. And I think, uh, when, I think the Chinese know much more than we do on what's really going on, and they have a feeling you know, of, of what might happen. And the ones that are capable and have the money to, to, to have a, a foot somewhere outside China, they are doing it. And I think that's a very good uh, example of, of what's going on. Just to, to finish, um, in respect of how to, what instruments or how to influence China. Honestly, I think it is impossible to influence China. Mm. Mm -hmm. We lost our opportunity. Our historical opportunity happened when China was joining WTO, when China was engaging with the rest of the world in mm -hmm. every sense. Now China is too powerful, and I really, I really don't see how we can influence them. I, I, I'm, I'm super pessimistic on that because on the other hand, I mean, I mean, they don't, uh, they, they are very um, aggressive in the sense that they don't want anyone outside uh, China telling them what to do. Yeah, l let me just come in at this point very, very briefly. Um, mm. I, indeed, I think we should uh, maybe focus uh, also on, on, on democracy support with, with, with some innovative methods. And sp specifically talking about China, Hong Kong has been mentioned, Taiwan is another um, word that should be mentioned, not only because they are living proof that indeed a Confucian society can function and thrive uh, uh, with, with political and economic freedom, um, but also because, you know, as Chinese society begins to interact, uh, well, with Hong Kong, where that's a, small, that's a small place, but with Taiwan, I do think that Chinese tourism and, and business connections um, are beginning, uh, or may actually be developed into something that has an effect on the future of mainland China as well. So, uh, it, it, you know, maybe we have to adopt new methods, support, support uh, civil society organizations in countries like Taiwan or places like Hong Kong. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, I, I do believe that our possibilities to influence uh, what the Chinese government does through classical international bodies like the United Nations are indeed limited. And we should be aware of that. But that should mean that, that all the more importantly, we should focus on, on civil society. Um, all right. Well, let me, let me continue with, with the panelists. Well, Jacob, you want to come in here? And then Barbara and yeah. Alfred. <clears throat> well, I, I agree with the point. I mean, if you look at... I don't have the numbers here, but there was a study a few years ago that, that looked at Chinese PhDs that went to the U.S., and, and the number of, of Chinese PhDs that stayed on in the U.S. is, is more than 50%, which, which should tell us something. And if you go through London, the, the glitzier parts of London, you can literally put a prize on the rule of law because Russians go there because they don't uh, trust their own government to let them keep the wealth that they have accumulated fairly or unfairly, uh, but that, I think that, that, that also shows that the rule of law um, uh, really is, is appreciated uh, by, by people living in, in countries without a rule of law. But I think there's another thing that, uh, that, that, that will have a bearing on, on how sustainable 
authoritarianism is in the future, and that is the question, you know, can you survive in a knowledge economy if you don't have, uh, if you don't have freedom, you know, do, how, how much does it inhibit China that ordinary citizens can't go on to Google or, you know, get a free flow of information? It's actually a, a research project that I'm mm. working on with an economist trying to measure how, is there a relationship between, uh, between freedom of expression and creativity? Uh, and I think that would be, I mean, uh, we don't know where it's going to end up, but if it, if it shows that there is uh, a strong relationship, then it's a very, you know, it, it, it becomes a strong, basically utilitarian argument that might be stronger uh, for authoritarians, uh, you know, to put in front of authoritarian states than, than pure moral ones that they will simply discard if they say, well, utilitarian uh, arguments uh, are what, you know, carries the day uh, for us. Um, of course, we all know that um, the internet has not only brought freedom, it has also brought um, the uh, you know surveillance and, and and other things, but but I think this is a this is a, a an important uh, a question of of how restrictive can you actually be if you want to be a thriving economy, uh, and I hope that uh, that you know the, it will show that 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 freedom is is a part of um, uh, you know is uh, really necessary to 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 be competitive. Thank you, Barbara. Mm. Sure. Well, uh, with China, I have to say that there's always a debate about the resilience of, of China, but um, I, I think I also see signs uh, that, that China itself is worried. Um, in addition to uh, the flows of personal resources, the investment in properties, the uh, acquisition of, of uh, residency rights, the having of children, uh, they call it tourism to the U.S. to have, have a child uh, so that your child can have U.S. citizenship. Um, but another aspect of this also is the, the recent, I think, severe uptick in repression in China um, against seemingly very benign things um, in addition to things that were openly tolerated. So uh, that, to me, suggests that uh, China itself is, is worried and doesn't, doesn't want any uh, organizing capacity on any topic to emerge <coughs> at the moment. So what are the, what are the avenues? Well, first of all, one of the areas of greatest concern, which, which we haven't gotten into much because it wasn't really the topic today, but is the information space out there. And China is very aggressively out there, along with many other allies, um, sort of trying to send this messaging on, uh, on the values issue um, and the more effective and sort of uh, economically you know, desirable approaches that they have to offer. And I think that, that Western countries have ceded the information space in, in serious ways um, and that much more could be done there. In and using the information space to uh, project a little bit of this confidence as well as reflect, I think, uh, Ralph, this, this internal, I mean, at least we discuss when we're falling short on our principles. We discuss openly, you're free to do it. Um, it's in some cases welcomed in our societies, whereas in other countries um, it's not allowed. So even the fact that we're questioning and we're falling short um, could be a benefit. And then looking more regionally at regional venues, because there are all kinds of civil society groups that need to be able to advocate at the, at the regional level, which is where the changing of the norms often starts um, and is even more effective than at the international level. Thank you very much. Uh, Ralf Fix, <laughs> we only have three minutes left now, okay. so just make it very so brief. So three quick remarks. First, I'm wondering why we all the time are talking about China. There are reasons for that, of course, because of the huge leverage of China, politically and economically, and because they are 
maybe the most self-confident authoritarian power, not the only one. Look at Iran, look at uh, then Russia. And if it's true that we have very limited influence from outside, I would say it would be a wise, forward-looking strategy to strengthen the democracies around China. Be they so in deficit they, they, they may be, but Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thai, uh, Thailand, you know, I, I think this Mongolia. is should be part of the strategy dealing with China. Not just building military alliances against it, no, it's strengthening the democracies in, in, in Asia and I, I'm quite optimistic that will have an impact uh, to, to China itself. Second, uh, we have a conflict now in, 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 in Europe that is very important for the future of democracy, especially in uh, the eastern parts of our continent, and this is Ukraine. And if we want to become Russia in the medium and long term a democratic state, which we should, part of the democratic European uh, community of, of uh, nations, we should do everything we can to make Ukraine a success story. To make it a success story in economic and political terms. Because this is what Putin is afraid of most. That Ukraine becomes an example that democratic transformation is not only possible, but could be successful. And this will send messages into, into Russia more than Radio Free Europe ever could. So, and, and the last part, why am I so obsessed with strengthening democracy at home? Not because I would ignore the difference between democracies in crisis and authoritarian or full-fledged dictatorial regimes, uh, but because we have to regain, I would say, a sense of optimism and a sense of democratic self-confidence in Europe and the United States and to regain uh, uh, an understanding of, of uh, uh, democracy as something we are proud of. And that is why we have to do our homework. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, f already a flamboyant ending, <laughs> but the organizers, <laughs> the organizers have tasked me with summarizing this, and I, I actually I have, I, I, I didn't manage to boil it down to three points. I have four points. Um, first of all, coming back to the question of Western universal values, uh, I think it's very important that uh, also that the, uh, our hosts named this uh, democratic values, not Western values, because yeah. indeed, as I also managed to insert into our uh, uh, language of our party platform, uh, these values are universal. They emerged under certain historic circumstances in the West. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the West may have a particular uh, uh, obligation uh, but, uh, but these values are indeed universal, and in fact, even the People's Republic of China subscribed to them. Uh, uh, actually, one of, the, one of the developers back in, in the late 1940s of the UN Declaration on Human Rights was a Chinese. Um, anyway, uh, second point is um, don't, don't stop advocating for human rights and for uh, democratic standards in global fora such as, for example, the United Nations. Um, don't stop advocating them in state-to-state -state or government-to-government -government relations, in the economic cooperation treaties and so on that we sign. So that is one stage. But um, the other one, and, and I, I find that also transpired from our debate, probably the more important one in the future, uh, the other level will be uh, supporting Democrats, supporting the people who represent these values and these democratic principles in other, in other places, sometimes even in authoritarian regimes and in dictatorships. And there we have to be innovative and, uh, you know, use, use social media, use the internet, 
uh, use regional, uh, region to region relations. Um, it, it find new ways into the civil societies of other countries. Um, so, so that is definitely uh, another point. And last but by no means least, well, yes, we do have to shape up ourselves. First of all, we, have, we, we constantly have to try to live up to the values that we advocate. Uh, and, and, and it's never easy, and it often goes wrong, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop trying. That doesn't mean we, we should stop trying. Uh, we have to continue, in fact. And the refugee crisis, indeed, <clears throat> is a litmus test for how seriously uh, Europe, in this case primarily, applies the values that it has always been uh, advocating. So to finish up, um, you know, when people, and, and in fact there's a lot of people in Europe uh, that sometimes tell me, Look, there are cultural differences, there are different cultures, why don't we respect them? Why do we have to try to, to, um, to push our worldview on others, like for example the Chinese? And my answer is always, remember the umbrella uh, revolution in Hong Kong a couple of months ago. Um, there, was, there was one clip that was trending in the very beginning where a, a, a Hong Kong student was stalk, talking straight into the camera and telling her, presumably Western audience, you live in freedom, I don't. You have an obligation to help me. Nothing to add. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you panelists, the audience. And I guess we're, we're moving into the lunch break now. Thank you. <laughs>